Welcome to Everything I Know, Perspective Edition. This video is meant for artists who wish to learn about said art fundamental. It also applies for architecture students, designers, and the like. I am by no means a professional nor a master on the subject. I'm just a student like you, sharing notes, lots of notes. I hope you find them useful. The length of this video may seem daunting and overwhelming to the beginner. My advice is that you explore it as needed and practice the concepts as they are introduced, since, as you will see, you do not need to know about them all to create believable perspective. So don't rush it. The demonstrations in this video were made on a drawing tablet for the sake of transparency. All of it is applicable to traditional art as well, no need for fancy equipment. Furthermore, I would like to divide the spectators into three groups and recommend a certain order of essential chapters that they ought to go through, chapters that will have the most relevance for the time invested. Of course, further study is always encouraged and the benefits shall appear. Type 1. The Hobbyist If you want to produce quote-unquote simple to moderate artworks or designs such as the ones you are seeing right now, I recommend you watch the video in the following order. Type 2. Dedicated student. If you are an architect or designer, you will most likely need to know a bit more. For more advanced and accurate drawings, such as the ones you are seeing on the screen right now, you need a heavier curriculum. When people think about perspective, that is, in the context of art and picture making, they think buildings and architecture. Why would I want to learn perspective if I want to draw characters? Here's the deal, it doesn't matter if you want to do backgrounds, characters, waves in the ocean or whatever, you will need some level of understanding of perspective to do that. I firmly believe perspective is one of the most important art fundamentals, and by the end of this video I hope you will see why. Chapter 1. What is perspective and why should I bother? It can be defined as a tool that helps us artists create the illusion of different planes, that is, different dimensions in two or three dimensional artworks. Think about it in the simplest of terms. We have a mark making tool and a markable surface. In said surface, we can make a mark that is vertical, horizontal or something in between. Here's the challenge, how do we represent depth, scale, distance and other stuff when we can only mark in two directions? Perspective. Perspective is intimately related to composition, which is arguably the most important art from the mental of them all. Composition is used in all forms of picture making, which even includes cinematography. In fact, one of the best ways to learn composition is through cinematography. But that's a tangent. Back to the matter at hand. In addition to its relationship with composition, adding perspective to your pieces will force them to make sense, meaning that they will work in a scenario that contains scale, depth, distance, etc. Over are the days of floating characters, wonky looking buildings and the like. Before moving on, I would like to emphasize that from now on we will discuss some of the quote unquote rules of perspective. Perspective. The term rules may sound like it is something that needs to be followed at all costs. I believe that in art there is no such thing as a right or wrong, there is an intention and an execution. So every time you hear me say that something is correct or incorrect, I will be referring to the concept of technical skill, that is, based on the grounds of reality. With that out of the way, let's dive into the theory of perspective. Chapter 2 Perspective Theory Remember when I said this is everything I know about perspective? Yeah, that was no joke. The following minutes will be dense, important and optional. Yes, optional. I also said that depending on what you want to create, some level of perspective is necessary, not all of it. In fact, as we will further discuss, you don't need to be 100% in any of the following concepts to make good art. This chapter is exclusively dedicated to showing and explaining to you the concepts of perspective drawing. We'll take a look on how to apply them, how to draw them in chapter 3. 
So think of this video as a two-part book. Introduce yourself to a fundamental, then get to drawing it. Horizon Line Eye Level Known as Horizon Line or simply the Eye Level, this is the basis of all we are about to discuss. The so important line can be defined as the point in which the horizon lays in. In other words, the point where the Earth meets the sky, the horizon line. If that didn't make sense, think about it as the line from which the beholder's eye is. Another way of viewing it is by simply understanding it as the height of the camera. Maybe that didn't help either. As most things in perspective go, you will have a better understanding of it with some practice and examples. Let's look at some pictures and observe the horizon line in red. Please notice that even though some objects may be in front of it, it still exists. Later on, I'll show you how to find the horizon line in the frame. By the way, sometimes the horizon line won't even be in the picture at all. A good rule of thumb is to position the horizon line on certain parts of the pages depending on what you want to show. Take a look at these examples. Low. With the horizon line being low on the frame, your picture will be consumed by the sky, meaning you will see most things from below. Middle. With the horizon line being in the middle of the frame, your picture will be divided by the ground and the sky. The portion of the ground and the sky will be the same. High. With the horizon line being high on the frame, most of the picture will be consumed by the ground, meaning you will see things from above, as if you were a bird. This configuration is also known as bird eye view, outside of the frame. With the horizon line being outside of the frame, your picture will be either fully in the sky or ground. Vertical horizon line Vertical horizon line occurs when we tilt objects in perspective. When tilting or cutting slices of objects in perspective, a new horizon line that behaves exactly as the one you're familiar with appears on top of one of your vanishing points. You will see this in action in the interesting scenario section as a demo. Vanishing points A vanishing point is an imaginary point which we use as a reference to construct forms in perspective. These vanishing points store plenty or, in some cases, all of the receding parallel lines in space. Any set of converging lines will lead to a vanishing point. Take a look at one of them. Yeah, it's a point. What did you expect? Now let's see it in action. Back to this image of the city. Observe that the vanishing point sits on the horizon line. The lines come from below and above the horizon line, and everything in this image is affected by it, even the clouds. So clearly, I'm not showing you all of the lines. For most of the cases in basic perspective, this will be the main configuration, one or more vanishing points sitting on the horizon line. Unless you're dealing with tilted objects or something more complex, this will be the main deal. The types of perspective For the perspective enthusiasts out there, no, there is no such thing as a perspective type. Yes, there are a lot of vanishing points and they all run across the planet. For the purpose of simply understanding basic perspective, we will reduce these concepts to these bare-bones scenarios. This trigger warning will be further explored in the real-life perspective section. I believe Uncomfortable put it best in Drawbox when he quickly defined the three main types of perspective drawing. Paraphrasing One-point perspective focuses on the side plane of an object. Two-point perspective focuses on the corner of the object, and three-point perspective focuses on the edge of an object. We'll now discuss the main types of perspective, and relax, you don't have to master them all right away, just take note that they exist. We'll practice them individually later on. One-point perspective Think of one-point perspective as having one main vanishing point in the horizon line. In its simplest terms, one-point perspective means that the set of lines that show depth will run to the vanishing point, while the other two will be parallel. We'll have one dimension that will be facing us, which is the closest to the viewer. Note that every object seems to have a side that doesn't get distorted, no matter where it is in the picture. 
it simply gets bigger or smaller. Take a look at these examples of one-point perspective focused artworks. Even though this image is crowded, the concepts still apply here. Take a look at elements such as the tiles on the floor, the receding architecture and even the people. But wait, what is that? A second vanishing point in one-point perspective? Yes, in fact, there is even a third one. These two new vanishing points were created because the original one-point perspective object was rotated. But for now, just know that this situation is possible. Even though we have our main vanishing point, nothing prohibits us to have as many as we want in our image. This goes for every perspective type. This is a more tamed example. Nothing crazy going on. Note that once again, no matter where the lines originate from, if they are receding in space, giving depth to an object, they will meet at the same vanishing point. Lastly, an example in which the horizon line is outside of the frame. This one conveniently has some of the perspective lines drawn already. By the way, this is a great book for comic book artists. Note the variety of artworks that you can produce starting with just the simplest type of perspective and we haven't scratched the surface yet. Two-point perspective. Not much changes here. Instead of one main vanishing point in the horizon line, we have two. Here the scenarios and possibilities expand greatly. Several of the old masters attempted to paint using this perspective type. I say attempted because perspective was invented slash discovered in circa 1400s, meaning that the artists before their time would simply paint as they saw having no conception of perspective. In the example images, you can see how now the corner of the object is an exposure instead of its planes. Now, two sets of lines meet in the vanishing points, and one is parallel. Here, both of the vanishing points are outside of the frame, which gives us a nice distortionless frame to work on. The closer your vanishing points are, the bigger will be the distortion. Once again, the main thing here is that the side of the objects will be in focus and two sets of lines will be receding to the vanishing points. Let's look at an antagonist example. In this drawing, both vanishing points are in the frame. Note that the closer the objects get to them, the more distorted they become. Also, since the vanishing points have roughly the same distance from each other based on the center of the image, look how both planes have the same real state. If we were to tweak it just a little bit, we'll get a more interesting angle, giving for instance more space to the left side. The more we bring these right vanishing points to the left, the more distorted its objects will be, because we're rotating it, in other words, diminishing its total area. Three-point perspective. Behold, a twist! The horizon line will continue to have two vanishing points sitting on it. Third one will be above, or maybe beneath it. It depends on what you want and the direction you're looking at. Look up and the third vanishing point will be there. Look down and there it will be too. This third vanishing point doesn't need to be in the very middle of the other two. It can arbitrarily be whatever you want, although to avoid distortion, you will want to keep it among the other two. In this type of perspective, the corner of the object is in focus. Do you like comic books? Well, lots of them work exclusively in three-point perspective. This perspective type is also known as Worms View and tends to generate dramatic and extreme pictures. Here are the relevant examples. The most important thing about three-point perspective is that every set of lines goes to a vanishing point, meaning all of our lines should be going away from the viewer. Note that as we look up on these buildings, they generate our third vanishing point. But that's not always the case. Since we have the ability to move the camera, the picture plane, around in space, we can choose to depict a three-point perspective building while looking directly at it, if you want it, for instance. I told you comics use it all the time. To give a dramatic feel in this Spider-Man piece, look how the artist not only used three-point perspective, but also tilted the horizon line slightly. This is called a Dutch tilt. Usually when you tilt the horizon line, you give the feeling of action. Tilt it a lot and you got yourself an extreme scene of action or tension. Curve linear, five-point perspective. 
This one is cool. So far we've been dealing with straight lines. In the curvilinear perspective, the lines, uh, well, they, they curve. Images using this type of perspective give the sensation of explosion. This perspective type is also referred to as fish islands. Here's how it works. You have two horizon lines forming a cross. In the center of the cross, we'll have our depth vanishing point. At the extremities of the horizon lines, forming a circle, lays our vanishing points. Think of it as a ball with cross contours. I know it may sound like a lot, but remember, we're only getting introduced to these concepts. We have to walk before being able to run. Note how the horizontal and vertical lines curve until they meet the respective horizon line, and then bend in the opposite direction. As previously discussed, the depth is achieved by retracting the lines to the center of this spherical grid. Here's the real-life example. Observe the buildings and shadows, they really sell the perspective. Now let's do a quick recap and see how a simple box behaves in each type of perspective. Once again, in one point perspective, one set of lines meet at the vanishing point and the other two are parallel. One plane is the closest to the viewer. In two point perspective, two set of lines meet in different vanishing points and one is parallel, the side of the object is the closest to the viewer. Three-point perspective differs from the others by having a third vanishing point above or below the horizon line. All sets of lines go to a specific vanishing point. The edge is the closest to the viewer. Curvilinear perspective has a grid like a ball with cross contours, and the very middle holds the depth vanishing point. The real-life perspective The previous knowledge is useful to be used to create art. Art, however, doesn't always need to respect the bounds of reality. In the real world, how does perspective actually work? Well, it's sort of a mix of them all. In reality, humans see the world through peripheral vision. And again, we elude and manipulate the forms to achieve similar results. Furthermore, not even when we have a simple cube in one-point perspective can we escape the real world. What I mean by it all is that all perspectives work simultaneously in all of the perspective types that we discussed. Don't believe me? Okay, here we have a simple vanishing point signal on a horizon line. Let's introduce some lines here. Now let's zoom out. I mean really zoom out. Like really zoom out. Now, let's compare how these very same lines that were originated from the same vanishing point are behaving. Looks like the space between them is increasing, and they are also flattering. Since we have infinite rays, imagine this phenomenon happening in lines that are even closer. We would, at some point, reach a place in which both of our set of lines would be completely parallel. Conserving the current scenario, let's say that we have one more vanishing point in this horizon line. Hey, doesn't it look like our original one-point perspective? In summary, all of the parallel lines that didn't converge to any vanishing points in the previous examples actually converge to a vanishing point. It is just really far away. If you want to keep researching the subject, refer to the sources and references chapter. Linear perspective versus isometric perspective. The system we've been using so far is called linear perspective. This, as previously discussed, aims to create an illusion of depth. But what about this isometric one? If you have ever played an old RPG called Tibia or Diablo 1, you have already experienced isometric perspective. The idea here is that the vanishing points are really far off in the distance, just like we discussed in the real-life perspective section. Essentially, all the lines here converge in the distance, resulting in this specific look in which every line is parallel, never touching within the picture frame. This type of perspective can be used in product design, aesthetic lo-fi illustrations and everywhere else. Remember, there are no rules in art. Lenses and cameras. Lenses? Cameras? What does it have to do with perspective? A lot, actually. If you want the short version, here you go. The wider the lens, the more dramatic the lines it will capture. The longer the lens, the steadier the lines capture. How do we apply in millimeters our lenses' properties to our perspective drawing? I don't know. Uh, this is everything I know about perspective and this one, I don't know. All I know is that it has some stuff to do with the station point. But honestly, I've never seen anyone calculate it by hand. 
at all. At most, they will mock a scene in a 3D software such as Blender and print it out to use as a base for their drawings, a very common practice for more complex scenarios. The figure in perspective. Remember when I said that perspective applies to everything? I wasn't lying at all. Every single element in our world can be reduced to a combination of organic and or inorganic forms. I'm talking of course about the simplest shapes known to artists, cubes, spheres, cylinder and the pyramid. That includes the human body. You will now see how knowing perspective can help you in your character drawings. First of all, let's reduce this complicated combination of anatomy we call the homo sapiens sapiens to a simple geometric form. Now, if you've watched the types of perspective section, you know that objects can be seen from different angles depending on the arrangement they're in. For instance, to see a cube from below, we must lower our horizon line. And to see it from above, we must simply lift it up. By applying these simple tweaks to our combination of forms, we can now show our character from different angles. Here I drew a simple mannequin from above, in three-quarter view. Now I'm drawing it from below. There's more. Let's say we're talking about a character that has accessories, like Batman. Notice how Ryan Benjamin draws the Bat Belt here. The Bat Belt will look different based on its configuration. In this case, it is tilted. It might seem simple, but details like this separate the professional from the dabbler. By the way, you probably remember the other name that the horizon line goes by. Exactly, eye level. The reason for it is that if we have one figure standing in perspective and we consider that the camera is at the same height of the figure, then every other figure that has the same height as the original one will have their eyes on the horizon line as well. But what if the figure isn't on the same plane? How do we calculate its height? To recede and forward its size, we simply use the vanishing points. And we can also keep the height, sum it or subtract according to our needs. What if the figure is laying down? There sure is a way to precisely calculate it, but I use ellipses. Simply eyeball a square and throw in an ellipse to know the quote-unquote correct length of the body. Cross contours. Think of cross contours as rubber bands wrapped around the form, a trail of ends, or whatever does the trick for you. These cross contours help us see the three-dimensionality of the form. They are especially useful in anatomy. Yes, there's a way to find them in perspective. And I'm sure that if you spend some hours, you can calculate them precisely. I, again, eyeball a square and throw in an ellipse. Cross contours can be incredibly helpful to learn about on our next topic as well, for shortening. So why don't we just hop on the next wagon and get to know them both a little better. Foreshortening. Foreshortening gets easier to understand as soon as you have a grip on basic perspective. The concept here is, things get bigger as they get closer. I have a simple arm drawing in a box, very little anatomy to it. Let's keep it simple. I divided it into three sections. Now I'll make a box in one point perspective and divided it into three sections just like the other one. We'll translate the simple diagram into this new foreshortened object. The line weight doesn't help to sell the image, so I'll throw in some quick and dirty cross contours to help you visualize it in 3D. Now imagine any form inside of this box, a cylinder, a leg, a car, anything. Another way to add some nice distortion to your figures is by simply putting them in a skewed box. It will give the feeling of a wide lens. Here's a great page by Andrew Loomis about it. Scale and measuring. If you've understood the concept of vanishing points, then this one will be short and sweet. If you treat each part of your object as a line, you'll see how easy it is to scale things in perspective. Concepts such as multiplication, that we will see in chapter 3, will help you to conserve the scale of objects regardless if they're higher, lower, or in the same plane. Note how Loomis uses one figure as a reference point for every other one in this page. This stands true in inclined planes as well. The demo you saw during the figure in perspective section also applies here. 
is a simplified version of what is going on here. A bit of composition in perspective. Before jumping into this topic, I would like to say that this is nowhere near the beginning of an explanation of what composition really is. Composition is perhaps one of the hardest fundamentals to teach and describe. This is simply an overlap of these two fundamentals, which results in a tip more than anything. Remember our friend Horizon Line? Of course you do. Did you know that by simply tweaking a little you can change the whole feel of your image? I'm serious. Take a look at these three examples. High Horizon Line. By keeping our Horizon Line high, our objects will appear smaller, which can lead you to think or feel that they are weaker, inferior or incapable. Middle horizon line. By keeping our horizon line in the middle, our objects will appear to have the same height as we do, which can lead you to think that they are equal in the power dynamic. Low horizon line. By keeping our horizon line low, our objects will appear to be bigger, which can lead you to think that they are stronger, threatening, etc. Tilted horizon line, Dutch tilt. By tilting our horizon line, it will give us the sensation of tension and action. Of course, that does not mean that you will use these patterns as a be-all and end-all rule. As I stated before, composition is way too broad for me to explain in a simple paragraph like this. The information above is a simple guide you can use if the situation doesn't call for anything extra. Perspective and design. Are you an industrial designer? Do you want to design houses, shoes, furniture, and everything in between? Well, you've got a good chunk of use for information here, but not all. I'm not covering how to design chairs or houses. There's way too much stuff to put in here, but I want to go over the basics and leave you with some references for further education. When designing anything, be it concept art or design school, you will have to think of two main things, design itself and utility. It might be the coolest looking show in the world, but if it sucks to wear and can protect your feet, chances are your sales won't be as good. Several drawings fundamentals also apply for industrial design, such as line weight, perspective, values, color, light, shadow, etc. So it's important to know your basics well, regardless of the path you want to choose. Fortunately, if you don't want to become an architect, you won't need as much technical knowledge and perspective. Depending on what you are designing, it might not apply. But say you're in the conceptual phase of a product, references will be your best friend. Always look up why that sports car has such bold shapes. Why is that phone seen so simple on the outside? Things like these will take you a long way. Measuring is especially useful in this kind of work, as you usually have to draw the same object from different angles. It is especially useful to know its measurements in real measures, such as meters or feet. For reference and further information on this topic, refer to chapter 4. Atmospheric perspective. The concept of atmospheric perspective is that things get smaller and lighter as they recede in the distance. This means that the closer an object is to us, the bolder the line weight and greater is the contrasting values. In the same way, the further it is to us, the lighter the line weight and the smaller the difference in value is. Chapter 3 Studying and Practicing Perspective Practical Knowledge, Exercises and FAQ Now that you are familiar with some perspective theory, let's put said knowledge into practice. Useful tools Although nothing more than paper and a pencil is needed in order to master perspective, some additional material can take you a long way. For the hobbyist, all you need is something to make a mark and a markable surface. Being it a pen, pencil, paper, cardboard, whatever, you're good to go. Designer If you want to design shoes, cars, houses, and any other thing related to industrial design, you will make good use of a transparent paper, technical pens, markers, rulers, French curves, circle and ellipse templates, and a compass. If you want to follow the industrial path, you will likely not use erasers, as in this style of drawing, you usually just jump to the next page instead of erasing. Architect. Aside from the designer materials, you will need a T-square, need a boy eraser, and a protector. Avoiding an isometric look. When plotting what is called a perspective grid, in other words, establishing a horizon line, a vanishing point, and rays radiating from it, 
you might want to differentiate the distance of one of the vanishing points compared to the other in relation to the center as to not end up with an isometric perspective, unless that's what you want. Avoiding distortion. If you don't want distortion in your drawing, but you don't want to calculate the whole cone of vision, simply put your vanishing points very far apart out of the page. The closer they get, the more distortion you will experience. However, putting them too far away may result in an undesirable flattening effect, much like a telephoto lens would. How to plot a grid when the vanishing points are outside of the page? As it often happens, you will likely face such turbulence in your journey. For both of them, consider that you can't see the underlying grid, the Brewer method. Let's consider the following scenario. By adding another vertical line as far away as possible, and from the bottom of it dragging it to the right, let's make another line from the top of the original vertical to the right and trace another vertical from the meeting point in the bottom. Now we have a three-dimensional triangle and two points in space. By connecting these two points, we have now found the correct guiding line that comes from the right vanishing point. Another way to make it work is by having at least two verticals in place, having this skewed rectangle in perspective. By simplifying the middle, in other words, actually measuring of the verticals, we can connect set points and done. This one works better if the rectangle takes most of the page, since you can apply it several times without having a guess. How to find the horizon line in a picture? In order to find the horizon line in a frame, you need to simplify two or more vanishing points. By following the converging lines until a point that they meet, we can find our vanishing points. If we trace a line between both of these vanishing points, we'll end up with the horizon line. Life, however, is not that precise. Things won't always be 100% straight. In reality, very rarely will we ever find such a scenario. In this demo, watch how I ended up with two leads. My recommendation for you is to make an educated guess when faced with these scenarios. Since I was about to insert a car in the ground, I took into consideration said vanishing point. What if the vanishing points are outside of the frame? In these situations, the approach doesn't change that much. We begin by following the convergent lines to get a general idea of where the horizon line can be. Ideally, just by looking at an image with certain experience, you should be able to see the area in which the horizon line is. If it's tilted, off the page, etc. Once we have a certain idea of where the horizon line can be, we can either use the Brewer method until we find it, or the second method presented before. At some point, an educated guess can be enough. In truth, the vanishing points will likely be more useful than the horizon line itself. Dividing, aka finding the center of a rectangle or box. In order to draw some basic shapes and different types of perspective, Let's learn how to do some operations with them. By keeping it simple, I hope you can easily understand this concept. Say we have a simple rectangle in one point perspective. In order to find the center of said plane, all you need to do is draw a straight line from each corner of the rectangle to its opposite side, forming a X, where both lines touch is the very center of your rectangle. This is fine and all, but what if you need to divide something into different units? Let's take a look at our original object. Say I want to divide it into three equal parts. To do that, we run a line parallel to the horizon line, divide it into the three equal parts, and then cross it to the beginning and end of our object, creating a new vanishing point. We now cross these parts with our object. The same is true for every perspective type. Ellipses circles in perspective. Observe this cylinder. You will see that the top ellipse is more distorted than the bottom one. This occurs because as we are looking down at the object, the ellipse becomes closer to being a circle. Make this experiment yourself. Grab an empty glass. If you hold it in a way that the top of the glass is right at the horizon line, you will see that it becomes a flat line. At the same time, the bottom portion is closer to being a circle because again, we are looking down on it. Ellipses fit in a square or a one plane box. Divide the box in the middle and you have your guide points. But doing a square every time you need an ellipse is not ideal. For that we have the simple tactics to construct one to the best of our ability. Freehand ellipses becomes easier once you've understood its anatomy. An ellipse has two axes, a major and a minor. What matters here is the minor one, because it points to the vanishing point. The minor axis is a link between the closest portions of the ellipse, while the major is the opposite. In other words, both axes the divide the ellipse in the middle. 
a well-drawn ellipse should have its minor axis acting as a mirror, dividing the form exactly in the middle. Draw some ellipses and try to identify them. When drawing anything in perspective, it's always best to do it in a confident manner, even if it's wrong. Scratchy lines show lack of confidence and uncertainty. Scott Robertson has some great exercises here. I can't add much, so just listen to him for a moment. You can try to draw almost like you were drawing a cylinder just to give yourself more practice, and this is not an easy thing to do. And then divide them in the middle, like that, and draw another straight line. And then see if you can line up ellipses that are on, treat this as your minor axis. Okay, and draw an ellipse on the minor axis that touches tangent to each one of those lines. Because it's these kinds of constraints, these mechanical constraints of tangency and a minor axis alignment that we need to master before we can start to place the ellipses in perspective. Another good one is just start with a line, kind of like I did there, but I didn't, I won't have the constraints of tangency to worry about. Just align it with however it likes to line up naturally with your arm to help you get a little mechanical advantage. And then just try to draw ellipses of varying widths, right, which is called the degree. So how narrow or how wide an ellipse is, right, and see if you can place them on that minor axis. Multiplying planes. Once the middle of the plane has been encountered, in order to multiply said plane, all you need to do is extend the lines that point to the vanishing point. Now, shoot a line from the vanishing point to the middle of the rectangle. Finally, from the first vertical line, on the corner of the rectangle, shoot a line on top of the cross form through the last drawn vertical line. Where this line connects with the one coming from the vanishing point is where the end of the plane should be. To prove this concept, I have this cube in Blender. If we measure it, we'll see it's a 2x2. Two two. So, theoretically, if we had a second perfect cube right on the side of this one, we would have a 4 meter box. I'll import the screenshot into Krita and use the multiplication method to foresee where the said second cube would be. Now, I'll just position my prediction on top of the video. I'll spawn another cube and move it exactly 2 meters to the right, aka the x axis. The small extra portion is due to the thickness of my brush, but the placement is correct. Mirroring planes. What if you want to multiply a plane or box, but not exactly to its very site? Or what if you want to replicate a form you've created based on simple forms? You mirror it. Ignore the blue square. I had issues while recording. Begin by once again extending the lines until they meet the vanishing point. Choose where you want to place your cloned plane and find the middle of the distance between this place and the original object or plane. This middle will be called main point. Move to the side furthest from the action. From here, shoot a line to the main point. Where it hits the line going to the vanishing point is where the end of this plane or object should be. From here, you can figure out the other parts of the object. I'll simply trace extra lines so you can see that this method is accurate. Now let's do some extra practice by cloning this whole box. Wrapping up same as before, now on the ground. Make the original object, find where the clone should start, find the middle of the distance between the original object and the starting point of the second, cross the lines, done. Mirroring curves. This isn't as tricky as it sounds. We'll use the same setup as before. Within these planes, let's design some curves. Once the curves have been drawn, we just need to pick some reference points through the dividing method and then we're ready to mirror it. Pick as many as you need, although there's definitely a point of diminishing returns. If we run some lines through these points, when reaching the mirror form, we can simply divide this one as well and use the overlaps to translate these points. You've got yourself a guide. Now simply freehand it. Let's see a more complex curve. Same deal, just more reference points.
mirroring rotated planes. Once again, nothing to be scared of. We will keep on relying heavily on reference points. If you did well with the previous stuff, this should come naturally. We'll have a new scenario for this one. In addition to the old techniques, I want to introduce a new one. Once we extend the lines of a rotated object to a line coming from one of our main vanishing points, we create a reference point and form a triangle. As we all know, we'll have in the middle the same angles. You can then use this triangle to mock a box and mirror additional reference points. This is also useful to mirror tilted planes. Rotating and tilting objects in perspective. There is only two ways I know of how to rotate objects in perspective. The visions of a bigger box and ellipses. Let's say we have the following scenario. A simple box in two point perspective. The first method is easier to understand if we look at it from above at the same time. Say we want to rotate this box 45 degrees to the right. First, we need to divide this big box into small boxes, making a sort of mini grid. Using it as a guide, we can simply rotate rotate the cube and translate it into perspective. The second method is through the use of ellipses, once again in one point perspective. Say we have a box, now let's introduce a second box inside of it. It will have one fourth of the size of the original box. By drawing an ellipse utilizing the area of the first box, we have a range in which we can rotate the second box. Every time we rotate this box, a new vanishing point will be introduced in the horizon line. To tilt an object on one of its axis in perspective, we make use of the vertical horizon line. The principles here are the same, once again, in one point perspective with the same old box. To tilt it in perspective, we'll introduce a second horizon line, vertically, on the top of the vanishing point we use to create this object. Note that depending on the side you want to tilt it, you will need to change which vanishing point you will use as a reference. If we want to tilt it forward, we can use a new vanishing point going upward, backwards, is downwards. The other vanishing point is conserved. Utilize ellipses to assist you in the rotation. If you want to rotate to more than one side at once, that's where three-point perspective comes into play. Interesting scenarios. So far we've discussed the construction of rather simple objects, but what if you want to draw a spiral staircase or a jack-o'-lantern. To draw a pumpkin in perspective, it would help if you are familiar with curvilinear perspective. You will see why in a moment. First, let's establish the angle we want to draw this pumpkin. If we were to simplify it to its most basic shape, it would be a sphere. But spheres look the same no matter the angle, right? That's why we'll use cross counters to help us here. Remember, the horizon line indicates if we will be looking up or down or the front of it. I'll make two cross sections, a vertical and a horizontal one. We can also spin our pumpkins to the left or right. Remember about composition? Tilt it back to make a pumpkin look menacing. Once we're happy with its position, let's take a second look at their basic shapes. We know that this nightmare fuel isn't all perfectly round. It has some distorted cylinders around it. Let's add them and keep in mind our cross contours. In fact, I'll add more of them. Note that the closer the cylinders get to the edge, the less space they have between them. Now, let's put a face in it. Ok, time to give it some depth. Remember when I said that it would be nice if we were familiar with 5 point perspective? Well, if we look at this pumpkin in an objective way, it is a curvilinear perspective grid. We have two horizon lines and the middle of it, you guessed it, it represents the depth. Let's finish it off. Remember to keep in mind the pumpkin form when drawing over it. The stairs aren't that difficult either. We'll first start by defining the range in which the stairs will exist. What we want now is a big cylinder out of it. Begin by dividing the box in the middle and then freehand the ellipses. Let's give it some height. Now choose the amount of steps you want. Do you remember how to divide the planes? Simply add a vertical line and apply the division method. Now each one of these cross sections represents a step. Follow the guides. I ate a little bit of the sides on the last step, but here you go.
calculating shadows in perspective. Relevant note. I won't be defining nor will I be explaining anything in regards to light and shadow other than the mere basics. We'll keep it simple here. It's either light or shadow, one value each. We'll also be working exclusively with local artificial lights. If you had a good grasp in mirroring your forms and shapes, calculating their shadows will be just some extra steps. The classical example here is the light bulb and the pole. Let's set a simple ground plane and introduce our pole. In order to find where the shadow will end up, first we need to trace a vertical line from the light bulb to the ground plane. Now we run it under the pole. To top it off, run a line from the light bulb to the top of the pole, hitting the last line you drew. This triangle we ended up with is the area in which light won't be able to access, the shadow area. The same will be true for a plane. Let's see how it goes here. By treating each pole of the plane isolatedly, we can at the end gather these triangles and review our cast shadow. What about a box? Same deal, simplify it to poles, then individual planes. Let's complicate it a bit. Floating curved objects and inclined surfaces. If you remember how to make curves, simply draw some curved objects and make them float. Now, to calculate their shadow, we'll need to extend their curve points to the ground and then prehand the shadows just like we did with the curves. When dealing with inclined planes, we just need to keep in mind the quote-unquote real end of our shadows, that is, where they end in the ground plane. You also need to take into consideration the structure of the plane the shadow is being cast on. Let's take a look at some examples. Here I cheated a little bit so we can have a more interesting scenario. For more complicated and complex settings, I suggest studying Blender for 30 minutes and using it as a reference. It's a good tool, use it as needed. Thumbnailing. Since perspective drawings can get complicated really quickly and usually are drawn in a big scale, thumbnailing small frames with the horizon lines alongside some vanishing points can save you plenty of time and resources, especially if you are a beginner and haven't yet developed your intuitive perspective skills. Pinpoint what you are about to draw. Do some thumbnail sketches to decide the perspective of the illustration before plotting the whole grid. And the best part is that you can transfer the grid to the big drawing once you're done. This type of technique is also useful to avoid having to calculate the color vision every time. Different angles. A nice way to test how you're grasping all of it is by drawing the subjects above or any group of subjects of your choice in different angles. If possible, arrange them in a still life or in a 3D software. Draw how they look and how they should look from different angles. Afterwards, check your answers. Here's a little example. 
Photos and Google Earth. Photos and Google Earth are amazing tools not only to learn and internalize the concept of horizon lines and vanishing point configurations in real life, but also amazing reference tools. If you ever feel like your backgrounds are bland or that you need a reference to compose a better foreground, middle ground, do not hesitate to use them. To use photos as a study tool is advisable to first pick a selection that references the learning goal. Do not pick pictures of buildings within the 60 degree kind of vision if what you want to draw are crazy fish islands fights. Once the selection has been made, utilize the converging lines to find the main vanishing points and horizon lines. Also remember that most of them will be outside of the frame. Let's do a simple exercise here. We'll get to Tokyo and I'll add some quick sketches over interesting places. In this scenario, I'm going to add a car. I'll leave you with this grid. You can screenshot it or print it out and draw your own building on top of it. Intuitive Perspective Intuitive perspective is what I consider to be the most important skill one can develop in its studies of perspective. It is the key to drawing from imagination and gives the artist the freedom to draw without sketching, with enough practice. How to hone such skill? In my opinion, the way to do it is by tweaking the infamous 250 box challenge to our needs. The idea here is to be 100% conscious and deliberate about the construction of the boxes, so much so that we will write down how they should look before having drawn them. Here's an example. First, we'll describe the face, side or edge of the box that will be visible in addition to its angle and the point of view. Here's an example. First, we'll describe the face, side or edge of the box that will be visible in addition to its angle and point of view. By doing the challenge this way, you will be able to draw any subject in the future from any desired angle. Some of you might need more than 250 boxes, some less. Feedback is of the utmost importance here, so get some. You know you're getting the hang of it when your spatial awareness increases to the point that it becomes second nature to you. Demonstrations Cartoonish car Concept sketches and thumbnailing is advisable before any attempt at a final drawing. We'll begin by establishing the working grid. You can start by making a cube. I'll just eyeball one to the best of my ability. Multiply it to the side and depth vanishing points. You want a rectangular box that is longer on its side. I want to make a racing car, meaning my rake will be low. In other words, no need to lift the sketch. My wheels will occupy two thirds of the total height and one sixth of the total length. Simply use the division method for this. I'll quickly scribble some wheels and tires. I recommend you use a reference for this. Since speed machines usually have bold designs and are full of curves, I'll be adding them everywhere I can. From here on, we're basically dealing with a myriad curves and divisions, nothing complex. Feel free to carve or add any new volume to this box. Look at real cars and observe the size of the cabin, the curvature of their hood and overall angulations. It will become obvious to you that very little is straight in a modern car. With the construction lines aside, I'll bold my final design so you can see it better. I'll give it a black outline and simple colors to keep it as a sketch. You can take it to the next level if you want. Two-story house, animation background. Building a two-story house is very simple. I want an American-style, modern look with a garage. When dealing with a house, symmetry is not as important as in a car. Consistent proportions are way more. I'll make two big boxes in this grid and use the division methods to delineate the correct measurements. From here on, I'll simply freely sketch on top of it. Then, I'll clean it up, taking the vanishing points into consideration. And that's about it. Aside from the use of ellipses here and there for windows, there's not that much of a complex heavy theory moment here to be analyzed. For time's sake, I'll add a simple outline, no line weights, nor colors. Yes, I could take it further with more props and render, but perspective-wise, I would be just repeating myself.
portrait. Organic shapes also exist within the rules of perspective. For the simple structure of face, I will use a simple box. Every aspect of the face behaves just like any other 3D object. I'll construct the face inside of it. Note how the closer side is bigger than the right one, how the eyes align to the vanishing point, and even the angulation of the lips, elements above and below the horizon line, etc. Say we were to add another face to the side of our original one. Set elements would respect the same rules. All of it applies to a full figure as well. Simplify it to boxes and then sketch on top of it. All of the information presented was extracted from the sources listed in the description of the video and pinned comment. Well, this is the end of the video. I ended up cutting short some parts of the video such as how to draw a perfect cube in perspective and primitive shapes in different types of perspective because I thought they were too technical and didn't have a place in this already long enough video. But yeah, I think this constitutes a good crash course in perspective, if anything, a good list of subjects for you to research in your perspective drawing training Well. It's about time that I go now. If you have any doubts or anything I left out, any editing errors or something that really breaks the content or anything you want to point out, feel free to comment down below and I'll try to help you out if you have some perspective doubts.